Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that. Now uh, uh, it's time for our intercessory prayers. Uh, and in our prayers today, we uh, continue to remember those affected by the pandemic uh, using prayers uh, from the 24-7 prayer movement. Let's pray. Just remembering that quote from Haley we've just heard from Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. We pray for all medical professionals dealing daily with the intense pressures of this crisis. Grant them resilience in weariness, discernment in diagnosis, and compassion upon compassion as they care. We thank you for the army of researchers working steadily and quietly towards a cure. Give them clarity serendipity and unexpected breakthrough today. Would you rise above this present darkness as the sun of righteousness with healing in your rays? May this be our prayer. Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. God of all wisdom, we pray for our leaders, the World Health Organization, national governments, and local leaders too, heads of schools, hospitals, and other institutions. Since you have positioned these people in public service for this hour, we ask you, Lord, to grant them wisdom beyond their own wisdom, to contain this virus, faith beyond their own faith, to fight this fear, and strength beyond their own strength, to sustain vital institutions through this time of turmoil. God of all wisdom and counsel, you are powerful and merciful. May this be our prayer. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. May El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty, who loves us, protect us. May Jesus Christ, his Son, who died for us, save us. And may the Holy Spirit, who broods over the chaos and fills us with his presence, intercede for us and in us for others at this time. For the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Now I shall invite uh, Joyce to give our reading, which is from Romans chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. 
This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Amen. By way of introduction, just to mention at the end of the, the service today, I will be including a link to um, uh, a Bible book club site, which has a section on Romans. Uh, for those of you interested in digging, di uh, digging deeper into the book of Romans that we're following in a series at the moment. And there'll be some uh, questions for discussion at the end on this chapter, uh, as we've done in previous weeks. Now, if someone asked you, if there is a God out there, what can I do to meet him? If I need his help to get through life, what do I have to do in return? How would you answer them? Different religions have answered in different ways. Some say, make sacrifices to make God happy. Others, do the right things, say the right things. Google says, don't be evil. But in Romans, it seems, Paul the evangelist has become Paul the teacher, and he's giving us a full presentation of his doctrine. Why? Well, it seems someone has put out there a false rumour, fake news about Paul. They allege his teaching encourages people to do evil, that good may result. He quotes this in chapter 3 and verse 8. And Paul replies, this is slander. But he doesn't leave it at that. He goes on to explain why to set the record straight before he comes as planned for a visit to Rome. So what is Paul's teaching then? We've seen in chapter 1 verse 17 in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. And that is essential for as later on in chapters 1 and 2 all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And furthermore, God, God does not show favouritism. God is consistent and reliable in his judgments. So even though Jews had been given the word of God in scripture, salvation is not a birthright. So he starts chapter 3 with a series of quotes from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, to prove that everyone is under sin. We are all guilty of sin and under sin's power. So where does that leave us with how to please God? The reading we've just had, verse 19, Paul states the problem. When the law in the Old Testament speaks, everyone shuts up. We have no defence before God, the judge. The law informs our conscience about sin, but the law itself won't justify us. Our long and sorry record of offences shows that we are utterly incapable of living the life he wants. As the prisoner in the dock, we have to just wait in silence for the inevitable verdict of guilty, unless we can come up with more evidence. But now, in verse 21, a new witness comes forward, Jesus Christ, who will demonstrate the righteousness by faith 
that is, is Paul's gospel. In one act of history, at the cross, he sets things right. He puts us in a right standing with God. It works by faith, because Christ's faithfulness makes it possible, and our faith in him will clear us. And it's the same for everyone. There is no Jew-Gentile distinction now. We're all in the same mess, and this righteousness is available to everyone. So how does it work? How does the cross do this incredible thing, outweighing all the evidence of our sin? Paul explains this, perhaps the most important ideas in all scripture, by using two pictures, both derived from the Old Testament story. Firstly, verse 24, there's redemption. The Greek word is apolytriosos. And this word takes us to the slave market. If you wanted a slave, you paid the owner a price, then they're freed from their bondage, freed from their old master to serve a new master. And Paul uses this idea to show that God needed no reason to free the slave. He just decided to, a pure gift out of sheer generosity. He paid the price as the only way to be sure. All we can do is accept it and surrender to it. This is redemption just like Israel had at the Exodus when God declared, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And Israel replied, In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. So redemption's the first picture, and the second one is in verse 25. The sacrifice of atonement. Again, a Greek word, hilisterion. And in this word, Paul takes us from the slave market to the tabernacle or temple, where, where they made the, offer, the altar in the holy place. And on the altar they put a special cover piece, sometimes called the mercy seat. And every year on the Day of Atonement, blood would be sprinkled on this cover of the altar. And the people's sins were forgiven, and God's wrath was turned away. This was the place where sin was dealt with. And now, says Paul, at the cross, God presents Jesus as the hilisterion, the atonement cover, the mercy seat on the altar of the world. And his blood shed there demonstrates God's justice. It displays God's righteousness in full view of everyone. In Jesus' character, in his word, in his deeds. And it displays God's righteousness in two respects. It demonstrates his, righteous, his justice for the past, before Jesus came, when until the cross, God had to endure patiently and leave sin unpunished. Literally, God passed over sin, as in the Passover. And secondly, it demonstrates his justice for the present after Jesus, justifying those with faith. So the cross acts both retrospectively and prospectively. The Son of Man redeems the slave. The Son of God atones through sacrifice. Jesus sets things right and enables us to live as God intended us to live. And in the rest of chapter 3, Paul repeats to the Jews who are relying on works that the only real righteousness is by faith. Faith meets the requirements of the law in its entirety. So Jew and Gentile both 
have equal access to the one true God. The Old Testament covenant was broken by Israel, not by God. Yet though the problem is ours, the solution is God's. And he has been completely consistent. So our righteousness is like being in the law court. Judge, judge, God as the judge giving a verdict. Whatever happened is accounted for. I pronounce the defendant not guilty. Set him free. Four hundred and fifty years ago, an army veteran called John Bunyan was suffering nightmares, a bit like post-traumatic stress. He left the established church and took instead to sports and games to try unsuccessfully to lift his spirits. He was in a spiritual darkness. And in his autobiography called Grace Abounding, he wrote this. As I was walking up and down in the house, as a man in a most woeful state, that word of God took hold of my heart. And he quotes Romans chapter 3, verse 24. You are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. But oh, what a turn it made upon me. Now was I as one awakened out of some troublesome sleep and dream. And listening to this heavenly sentence, I was as if I had heard it thus expounded to me. Sinner, you think that because of your sins and infirmities, I cannot save your soul. But behold, my son is by me, and upon him I look, and not on you. And I will deal with you according as I am pleased with him. John Bunyan soon became an early Baptist church leader. He was imprisoned for his faith and in prison wrote the timeless bestseller, The Pilgrim's Progress. May we have that experience of his word of God, this word of God, taking hold of our heart waking us from sleep, his amazing grace, all for Jesus. So what can we do to get God on our side? Unlike every other religion, Christianity says that's the wrong question. There's ultimately nothing you can do for God. Nothing is good enough. The good news is God has done it for you. One incredible act at Easter was good enough. It frees the prisoner. It washes clean the polluted. It does it all for you. It calls only for your humble acceptance. But that acceptance changes everything. Amen. Just have a moment of reflection on our need for grace and God's wonderful work for us. And as we come to a close, I invite Joyce to finish the rest of Psalm 143, giving us a firm footing for his glory. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. 
in your unfailing love, silence my enemies, destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. After we finish this, uh, there'll be a video clip of a, a new song to us called Oceans, which I think is, will be a blessing to you. But as we, as we come to a close, let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that we are your servants. We thank you that you overcome our problems. Lord, we ask that you teach us, as the psalmist says, show us the way. For your name's sake. Amen. And a prayer of blessing. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you back rejoicing in the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you back rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.